a continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who also stripped him and having wounded him went away, leaving him half dead. And it chanced that a certain priest went down the same way and seeing him passed by. In like manner also a Levite, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan being on his journey came near him and seeing him was moved with compassion and going up to him bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and setting him upon his own beast, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two pence and gave to the host and said, Take care of him and whatsoever thou shalt spend over and above I at my return will repay thee. Words taken from St. Luke's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. In November of 2001, CIA agent Johnny Spann was sorting through a group of prisoners Over 300 Taliban soldiers have been captured by U.S. forces. And Mr. Spann was trying to determine which of them were actually members of the Al-Qaeda terrorist group. Eventually, Mr. Spann spotted a prisoner that looked very much like a Westerner, perhaps from Europe or the United States. The CIA agent asked the prisoner his name and just how the heck did he end up fighting for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban against the United States of America. Prisoner's Muslim name, at least, was Suleiman Alind. But at one time, his name was John Walker Lind, a young man from California who'd been baptized and raised by his Roman Catholic parents. This young man, who has been called Johnny Jihad, Johnny Ben Walker, and the Taliban American is still serving out a 20-year sentence in jail. And his lawyer has stated that Mr. Walker spends most of his time studying Arabic, the history of Islam, and the Quran. Well, I would like to ask the same question that Mr. Spann asked, namely, just how did John Walker Lind end up being the Taliban American? Well, John was born in February of 1981 to Frank Lind, a worker at the U.S. Department of Justice, and to Marilyn Walker, who was a stay-at-home mom. He was brought up with two other siblings in Silver Springs, Maryland, and the family was registered, at least, at St. Bernadette Catholic Church. That was the parish of John's baptism. Of course, he had not been named after St. John the Evangelist or St. John the Baptist, but rather he had been named after the rock star, John Lennon. Eventually, John and his whole family moved off to the very progressive area of Marin County, California. And there, John was sent to alternative schools, schools in which his academic training was completely self-directed. And so without any structured classes, with no particular teachers directing him, John pursued his own thing including the study of Islamic culture. His religious training was largely self-directed as well. John was very intrigued, even when very young, with religion and anything spiritual. He was starved for these things. He had spiritual needs. One friend of the family stated that Marilyn Walker, the mom, opened up all the doors of the family and the kids into all religions instead of dragging them only into Catholicism. Marilyn Walker, by the way, left the Catholic Church and became a Buddhist when John was just a teenager. And as for the dad, Franklin, well, he embraced, shall we say, an alternative lifestyle, a San Francisco way of life. 
Eventually, John Walker Lind, who had neither been introduced to the great mysteries of our Catholic faith nor been given the great spiritual treasures of Christ to fill his need, became a Muslim at 16 years old. And so on every Friday evening, John Walker Lind would change out of his Western clothes and into Islamic robes in order to attend prayer services at the local mosque. As for his parents, Frank Lind, the dad, was proud of his son's newfound dedication to study the Koran and thought that his quote-unquote conversion had actually been good for him. John's mom was just a little more concerned, not so much about Islam, but the fact that her child might be getting just a little too religious. The parents did not seem overly concerned that their child was apostatizing, was literally rejecting the entire truth of revelation of Jesus Christ in following a false and demonically inspired religion filled with error, darkness, and much, much superstition. Instead of challenging him, confronting him out of charity and love, Frank and Marilyn had fallen prey to that revolutionary error of religious indifferentism, where basically one religion is seen as good as any other, and that all religions are equally equipped to bring people to perfection and heavenly reward. Now, the case of John Walker Lind is truly tragic. Here was a boy that hungered for truth and religious things, and so committed was he to Islam and for truth that he moved to the Middle East and eventually to Pakistan when he was only 18 years old. You see, he wanted to live the life of a Muslim in an extraordinary way, to live a godly and religious manner. He would have made, let's face it, an incredible Roman Catholic. He may even have become a monk, a priest, if he had only been raised in the faith that he was baptized in. I wonder if John's parents went to Mass with their children every Sunday and on special feast days during the week. And I wonder if they went perhaps to Vespers or to Benediction or prayed the Rosary together as a family. I wonder if they read from the Holy Bible or, or maybe encouraged John and his children to read the lives of the saints or the classical writings of Western culture, the classical writings of St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Teresa of Jesus. And I wonder if John and the other children had received all of those important sacraments, confirmation as well as the most blessed of all sacraments, or if they went to confession regularly as a family with dad leading the way. I wonder if they were given solid religious instruction. Was Catholicism ever, and I mean ever, a topic at the dinner table? I wonder if they visited religious sites as a family or went on pilgrimage, not to Saudi Arabia, God forbid, but to famous mission churches along the California coast or perhaps even to Rome itself. In short, I wonder if John Walker, Lynn, Johnny Jihad, Johnny Ben Walker, the Taliban American, was ever given the full riches, the treasure that is the Catholic faith. And the answer to all of these questions is tragically no. Having not been given the treasure, the pearl of great price, John searched elsewhere and he only found the costume jewelry of what is a counterfeit religion. Now, John Walker Lind, mind you, was not a victim of Muslim fundamentalism. He was not a victim of bin Laden or the Ayatollah Khomeini. He was not a victim of all of these Muslim things. No, John Walker Lind was a victim, was a casualty of the revolution in the once Christian West, past tense. The once Christian West, a liberal and revolutionary spirit that has largely abandoned and cast off its Christian past and the order that God has established with Christ as our King and his Catholic Church as the one and only kingdom of truth and salvation. In short, John and so many other Catholics in the West 
have been robbed of their faith. Now, open this conference. I read a very famous parable from our blessed Lord. A story of thieves, a fallen man, and a good Samaritan. Now, this story, so beautifully recounted by our dear Lord, has deep spiritual meaning that goes far beyond loving your enemies and doing good to those who have needs. According to the great teachers of our holy faith, this parable points to the very mystery of salvation. Now, allow me just to do a little quick Bible study. Just a little, little bit of an exegesis, if you will, pulling out some of those spiritual gems which the church fathers found in the past when they looked at this passage of our Lord. A man fell prey to robbers. That man, spiritually speaking, is Adam. That man is Adam and his children. That man represents the entire human race. And who are those robbers? Those robbers that strip Adam of his grace? Well, they're the devil, the demons. And where is the man heading? Well, you see, he's heading away from God, isn't he? He's heading away from Jerusalem, the Bible tells us, and towards Jericho. Jerusalem has always been seen as God's resting place. It is a holy city. It's a city of peace, a city that has elevated some 2,500 feet above sea level. Where is Jericho? It's always been seen as an evil city. It was cursed by God. And, of course, it was knocked down its walls by God. When that Ark of the Covenant and the Jews went around those walls and blew their horns and shouted, Jericho was always seen as an evil city. It is a city that represents the spirit of the flesh, the spirit of the world. It's a city of spiritual blindness. It's a location that is literally the lowest place on the surface of the earth, some 900 feet below sea level. And as a Jewish priest and the Jewish Levite pass by, they can't do anything to heal this fallen man, for the Old Covenant cannot bring salvation. It is always imperfect. Only Christ in His New Covenant can heal the wound of sin with the gift of grace. And who is the Good Samaritan? The Good Samaritan is our Lord Himself, Jesus Christ. But wait a minute, Father. According to the Bible, Samaritans were always enemies of the Jews. They were always at odds. How could Christ be seen as a Samaritan then? It's because after the fall of Adam, after the original sin, we were at odds with God. We were enemies of God. St. Paul states that we were children of wrath because of the sin. So Christ then is the true Samaritan who loved us even when we were his enemies. And that good Samaritan poured oil and wine into the wounds of the man and bandaged them up. This is so sacramental. Oil being the very matter for the sacrament of extreme unction for the anointing. And yes, the wine which would become in the chalice at the words of the priest and the power of the Holy Ghost, the very blood of the divine Savior himself. And the bandaging represents confession And eventually the good Samaritan places the man, the fallen man, upon a beast of burden, a donkey, let's say. Fathers tell us that that represents the humanity of Christ that bore upon his shoulders all the sins of every man, woman, and child along with the weight of that holy wood and walked all the way to Calvary. And finally, the man is taken to the inn, that safe place which is an image of the Catholic Church herself, And the Good Samaritan then gives responsibility for the continued health of the man to the innkeeper. Do we not see our dear Lord giving charge, responsibility to Peter, to the Pope, giving him the good keys in order to open up the rooms of the inn and also the gates of heaven? Take care of him, our dear Lord says, until I come again in my second coming. Let us pray that John Walker Lind... And all those Catholics in the West who have been robbed of their faith by the devil and his offspring, that they may be visited by the Good Samaritan and eventually brought back to the inn that gives them salvation. Now, it's interesting that whenever the Catholic Church is described in the Holy Bible, it is without exception 
always shown to us in very visible ways. The church is the inn. We can see an inn. It's the inn of rest. She is the ark of salvation that saves us from the flood. She is the vineyard of the Lord. She is the temple with many living stones. She is the bride of Christ. She is his very body. You see, the importance of visibility. You see, the Son of God became visible and sensible by becoming man through the womb of the virgin in order that men could, well, find him and could be saved. And so it is with his Catholic Church. It is to be seen. It is to be sensed. It is to be heard by mankind so that she can be searched for, eventually found, and yes, joined by all those who are of goodwill and truly seek the truth. Men are creatures. God knows this. They're made up of body and soul. All of our knowledge first comes to us through the senses. That is why there is no such thing as some purely invisible church. That's one of the many, many errors of Protestantism. There's no such thing as some purely spiritual church that simply floats above us. Rather, we see the true church can be seen and touched and heard just as Christ was seen, touched and heard. The true church has marks. We know this. It has sensible characteristics. It has marks and traits. She is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The true church is a society. It has visible membership. It has sensible sacraments. And yes, it has also a visible governing structure. And with this in mind, let me provide you with perhaps the best definition of the church I know of. It is given to us by St. Robert Bellarmin, a favorite of traditional Catholics, a doctor of Holy Church and a one-time head of the Holy Office in Rome. The Holy Jesuit writes the following, quote, The one and true church is the congregation of men bound together by the profession of the same Christian faith and by the communion of the same sacraments and under the rule of the legitimate pastors, especially the vicar of Christ on earth, the Roman pontiff. Great definition by Robert Bellarmine. In reality, then, the true church of Christ can be found for those who are willing to look for her. As the famous Latin phrase says, Ubi Petrus ibi Ecclesia, where there is Peter, there is the church, and Peter is in Rome. Now, one of my favorite visible descriptions of the Catholic Church because she is a visible church, is that she is the mountain of God. The whole theme of this mission is climbing the mountain. In the book of the prophet Daniel, we not only have his great exploits of saving the poor woman like Susanna and surviving the lion's den and also killing Bel the dragon. Daniel, we also see in that prophecy, he has a gift, a great gift of interpreting dreams. In one particular dream Daniel interpreted was that of the great Babylonian leader, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you remember from your Holy Bible, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, a dream of a gigantic statue with a head made of gold and the chest and arms made of silver, and eventually the belly and the thighs made of bronze, and the statue's legs were made out of iron, and then the feet were kind of a mixture of clay and iron. And then in the same dream from the Babylonian king, the hand of God comes down and cuts a small rock, almost as if it were a pebble, from a mountain. And it comes floating down upon the feet of the statue. And as soon as it makes contact with the feet of the statue, it immediately disintegrates the statue. And all of a sudden, everything begins to fall apart in the statue. The iron, the bronze, the silver, the gold. And it becomes as dust chaff blown away by the wind. The rock then in the dream becomes a gigantic mountain that fills the entire earth. With divine enlightenment, Daniel explains the various secular empires and worldly kingdoms symbolized by the statues are bound to fail. All liberal republics that are in the Western world will fail, including this one. And of course, as Our Lady of Fatima said, 
some nations will even be annihilated. But eventually, Daniel prophesies, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty ever be given to another people. It shall break into pieces all these kingdoms around and will bring them to an end. But it shall stand forever. Not even hell can beat this kingdom. What is Daniel talking about? He's ultimately talking about the Son of God, who is the stone rejected by the builders that has become a cornerstone of a new temple, the temple of his body, the kingdom of God on earth, the Roman Catholic Church built upon the rock, the little rock of St. Peter, a kingdom that will last forever. Again, not even hell can prevail against her. And this stone, Christ in his Catholic Church, will grow and become a great mountain covering the whole earth, bringing both Jew and Gentile to heaven, bringing the only, being the only connection, the only summit that can bring us to the heights above. Now today, in the modern world, we hear a lot about religious pluralism. People tell us that religious diversity is our strength. The fact that on any one city street in the United States you might have a Presbyterian assembly hall, a Lutheran hall, or a congregational church, whatever, or maybe even also a synagogue on the same street and maybe a mosque and then a a little Catholic church down the road as well. All this is seen as wonderful, as American as apple pie. But do you really think the blessed Lord who is one God who sent only one Savior to establish one kingdom with one saving message, truly desires such pluralism filled with falsehoods and contradictions as part of this diversity? Of course not. Rather, he allows it. He tolerates what is an evil of division with his permissive will, knowing that one day, one day that one flock which exists now, that one shepherd which exists now, will be fully manifested to the entire world as the one mountain of the Catholic Church with the vicar of Christ, the Pope. You see, dear people, our God is, as we've mentioned, El Shaddai. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God on top of Mount Moriah receiving the sacrifice of Abraham. He's the God on top of Mount Sinai giving Moses the Ten Commandments. And yes, he is the good Lord who answers the prayer of St. Elias on Mount Carmel and defeats the false prophets of Baal. And yes, he is the God of Mount Calvary who went up that mountain step by step to lay down his life in atonement for our sins. But now this one God sits atop of the mountain of the Catholic Church, which is the one and only elevation that can bring mankind to heaven. Those high ridged mountains we read of so often in the old Jerusalem are no longer blessed by God. For the old Israel is no longer the people of God. Now the good Lord sits enthroned above the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, the kingdom and the mountain of God on earth, the church of Rome especially, with its seven hills and seven sacraments. Now let me give you just a little tidbit of history. An important little tidbit that demonstrates this switch that God has worked by his divine providence. This switch of God's people from the Middle East to be centered actually in Rome, the center of the Gentile world at one time. In the year 70 AD, an important year, the year when the Jewish temple was completely destroyed, according to our Lord's prediction. In the year 70 AD, a Roman general named Titus defeated the Jews in a war known to history as the Jewish Wars. And General Titus returned to Rome and triumphed with all the spoils of war. And what he actually brought back to Rome from the Holy Land is known to history because of a major monument in the eternal city known as the Arch of Titus. Many scenes of the victory over the Jews are carved into that monument. All the spoils of war taken from the Holy Land and brought to Rome, again carved in that monument. The Holy Candelabra, the menorah, again brought away from Jerusalem and brought to Rome. The little table that held the incense, the table that held the showbread, brought away from Jerusalem towards Rome. 
The veil of the temple, the silver trumpets that called the Jews to prayer, again brought away from the Holy Land and brought to Rome. And then also the temple books, the Torah, brought away from Jerusalem to be kept now by the church in Rome. Now the special things that also were taken included marble. Marble and stone from the temple itself were at least in part brought to Rome. That temple, which at one time was the place of sacrifice, many of the stones brought to Rome because Romans were always hungry for more building material. They were building structures constantly. Our dear Lord had predicted that the Jewish temple would be completely destroyed with not one stone upon another, for his people had rejected the time of their visitation. He came to his own, and his own received him not. That wailing wall, that wailing wall we see in Jerusalem, where many Jews still pray today, is not and never was a part of Herod's temple. But what happened? I mean, what happened to some of that stone from the temple, that glorious temple of King Herod? When it came to Rome, what happened to that stone? Well, archaeologists have determined that some of these stones, at least, were used to build the Colosseum in the Eternal City. Extraordinary. Yes, at one time, the temple that had been a place where sheep and bulls had been sacrificed, but now these stones would be used to build an arena where Catholic martyrs would be sacrificed. But as we know, that victory of General Titus and the pagans of Rome was very short-lived because soon a Jewish man named Simon, son of John, would come to the eternal city. Yes, a man would receive from the lips of our Lord himself the name of Peter. He would come to Rome along with those keys taken with him And he would come with other followers of the way, and eventually, through their blood, they would convert Rome and eventually the entire empire to the Catholic faith. From the center of the Gentile world, from being a city of man, a pagan city, a Babylon that drank in the blood of the saints, Rome would become the city of God, the new Jerusalem. And this should always be a warning to us. I am not... And you are not American Catholics. We are Roman Catholics who happen to live in America. There is no such thing as the American Catholic Church. There is only the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of Rome is the brain, the heart of the universal church. The Church of Rome is the capital of the universal church. The Church of Rome is the very cradle of Holy Church. See, she is the mother church, and all other churches are but daughters to her. But seeing the Roman Catholic Church as the one and only mountain of God, and the one and only stairway and ascent to heaven is very different from the way that modern men view religion. Now, the classic view of religion today was given to us by Kentucky's own Muhammad Ali. Famous boxer turned Muslim once said that religion is like water. There are different bodies of water. There's streams and rivers and ponds and lakes and oceans and seas. But in the end, it's all water. And so it is with religion. There might be different religious groups with differing viewpoints, but in the end, it's all the same religion. Well, to quote another boxing fighter of sorts, Mr. T, I pity the fool. What we have here again is the classic case of the great American error, religious indifferentism at its finest, where all religions are seen as equal and can bring about perfection and salvation to all. This great error, which is so much a part of liberalism and it is Masonically inspired, always leads to practical atheism. Western culture becomes, practically speaking, atheistic every time. Since all religions are supposedly equally equipped, and no one religion is truly the true one, the state 
and the population in general begin to see religion as, well, unimportant. It's unnecessary. And that's why we as Catholics always honor and venerate the great kings of old. St. Stephen, St. Henry, St. Louis the Ninth. Why? Because they favored and established the Catholic Church in their empires because they were concerned about the most important things of all, the salvation of their subjects. And they knew that the only way their subjects would find salvation was through the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the devil, he knows. The devil knows that there's only one mountain of God, and so he wishes to increase that confusion of those who live in the valley of the earth. That smog of Jericho we've talked about, it blinds so many, causing people to climb false summits. They go off and join false religions, but that only brings people to the abyss. Confusion. Confusion and even error has plagued the membership of Holy Church for decades now. And statements coming from our shepherds seem at times ambiguous at best. It reminds me of a sermon given one time by the great church father, St. Ambrose, the one who baptized St. Augustine. St. Ambrose once in a homily compared Holy Church to the moon in the sky that receives all of its beautiful light from the sun, the lux mundi, the light of the world, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But as we know, sometimes that moon, sometimes in the course of a month, that moon seems to give up some of its light. The orb of the moon always remains intact. The church is indefectible. She cannot ultimately be defeated. But the whole of the moon does not always shine. Sometimes a certain, certain shadow appears over the moon. And in the case of a new moon, it seems to have lost its light completely. St. Ambrose, again the great church father, writes, The moon to which the Lord has granted the important duty of illuminating the night sky to the world goes through a process of waxing, increasing in light, but also waning, decreasing in light. Church has her up and downs, in other words. But this great church father is not filled with despair at such an observation. For he knows, he knows that the good Lord allows such a lessening of the brightness in order that he may replenish it, that he may come to our rescue. Holy Church, I guarantee you, will once again shine with all the brightness, all the beauty of clarity and of pure doctrine. Dear people, dozens and dozens, and yes, dozens, of private revelations from Catholic saints assure us that there will be one day in the future an ecumenical council, a church council unlike any other that will explain and clarify all disputed doctrines, a council that will put to rest so many of the divisions by its forceful and yes, unambiguous teachings. And this will be part of ushering in fully that age of peace promised in the Holy Scriptures and promised by our Blessed Mother. And may that future counsel come, and may it come soon. Confusion. Confusion and the smog of Jericho are especially present today in the area of ecclesiology. Fancy word which just means the study of the church. The devil and his seed want to stop our climb up the mountain of the church. And they do this first and foremost, the devil, by denying that Christ even established a church in the first place. Let me explain myself just a bit. Most of you have either heard of or perhaps even taken certain Bible study courses. Well, you probably heard from some more uh, modern scripture scholars, that St. Mark wrote the first gospel. And that St. Matthew, or perhaps uh, likely his disciples, well after his death, using both St. Mark and something they call Q, compiled another gospel. 
These scholars tell us that St. Mark's Gospel is so primitive, it's so pure, it's so pristine. That St. Matthew's Gospel, it's filled with so many additions to Christianity like the papal office, ecclesiastical authority, the idea of church, of the church being founded by Jesus Christ. Of course, such statements by those who suggest that St. Mark was first goes against common sense. For this thing that they call Q, with supposed quotations from Jesus, has never been found. It doesn't even exist. But it also goes against tradition. I mean, there is a reason why Holy Church lists the Gospels in a particular order. order. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because that's the order they were written in. If you just read the lives of the Holy Saints, you will realize that nearly all of the early apostles eventually used St. Matthew's Gospel to preach from. St. Matthew's Gospel was the Gospel of the Church. That's why it's so often read at Holy Mass in the traditional liturgy. St. Bartholomew, an apostle. St. Bartholomew, the Roman martyrology, tells us took this Gospel of St. Matthew as he preached in India and Armenia and preached the Gospel before he was flayed alive. And St. Barnabas... The companion of St. Paul, when his body was exhumed from the earth, he was clutching St. Matthew's gospel in his hands. Tradition tells us that St. Matthew, before he went off to even preach to that territory assigned to him by St. Peter, first wrote his gospel, the first gospel in Hebrew. But I have to ask this question. Why go through this, first of all? Well, someone's benefiting from this. Someone is benefiting from this confusion of saying that St. Mark is first. St. Mark supposedly being the first gospel was put forward by German Bible scholars in the late 19th century. That's the first time it came up, the late 19th century, under the direction of the puppet master, Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor of the new German state. Bismarck, always against the Catholic Church, Bismarck sought to unite his country evermore. And he wanted to remove any allegiance that Catholics in Germany might have to the Pope. And so therefore, if he could get Catholics to question that Jesus founded the Church upon St. Peter, and to question or even doubt that the Catholic Church was given the highest authority on earth, then maybe... Maybe his culture war, that's what he called it, his culture war, his Kulterkampf against the Catholic Church would work. See, St. Matthew's Gospel provided many, many problems. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, our Lord turns to Simon, son of John, and says, Tu es Petrus, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesiastical structure, my church. Also in chapter 18 of St. Matthew's Gospel, our Lord speaks of the church, that ecclesiastical structure, that visible church, as being the highest authority on earth. And if persons don't listen to the church, our Lord said, let them be treated as a heathen or a tax collector. Let them be cursed, anathema sit. But without any proof, And going against all ecclesiastical tradition, Bismarck and his underlings at various German universities, let's face it, have largely succeeded. Today, in most schools, and perhaps in some seminaries too, and in nearly every Bible study book I have ever looked at, Mark is always seen as the first gospel, and there's always a question of whether or not Jesus established the Catholic Church and the papal office. Now, not too long ago, I actually was in Louisville, Kentucky. And let me tell you, it's Louisville, two syllables, not Louisville, Louisville. And I met a person there who announced to me that she was a member, no joke here, she was a member of the Happy Church. And I said to her, The happy church, where is that located? And the woman went on to say to me 
that it was a non-denominational church in southern Indiana. Well, I stopped there and I said, did you say non-denominational? Then it must be a Catholic parish, this happy church. For the Catholic church is not and never has claimed to be a denomination. The Catholic Church is the one and only church founded by our dear Lord, Jesus Christ, in the year 33 AD, upon the rock of Peter. And unlike a denomination, the Catholic Church does claim to have a complete monopoly on all saving truths and all saving graces. Outside of her, there's no saving truth. There's no saving grace. There's no true worship of God. There's no hope of salvation. This is our faith. We say it every Sunday. Credo unam sanctam catholicam et apostolicam ecclesiam. I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There's one Lord. The Bible tells us that. There's one faith. One faith. Not face. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. And there's one church. The church is not a tree. She's not a tree with various branches issuing forth, such as Catholicism and Anglicanism and the Orthodox and the Lutherans. But again, the devil has sown his evil seed of denominationalism into the minds of most every Western Catholic. Christianity, the church, or even religion in general, is seen by most people as if it were like Major League Baseball or the National Football League, with various teams, religious teams, sharing in this game of salvation. The Catholics might be the Red Sox. The Church of Scientology might be the Yankees. Baptists might be the Cubs. Maybe the Muslims be like the Detroit Tigers. Congregationists like the Kansas City Royals. Pope Pius XII of holy memory. He wrote two great encyclicals. Two great letters regarding this issue of Holy Church. Mystici Corporis and the encyclical Humanae Generis. They're papal letters, and they show the teachings of the church as a full moon shining forth in the night sky. And the first letter, Pope Pius XII writes that the mystical body of Christ mentioned in the Holy Bible is, est in Latin, is the Catholic Church. In that second papal letter, the Pope reiterates, stating that the mystical body of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church are identical, one and the same thing. And if this is true, which it is, then all Protestant groups, all Orthodox groups are not part of the true church. And this is not my personal opinion, but rather the teaching of Holy Church. Blessed Pius IX, Pope of the 19th century, taught the following, quote, None of those religious societies separated from the Catholic Church, not even if you take them as a whole, constitutes in any way and are not that one church founded by our Lord. Pius IX continues, Further, one cannot say in any way that these societies are either members of or parts of that same church because they are visibly separated from Catholic unity, unquote. Now, it should be noted also that that means there's no such thing as a Protestant or a Greek Orthodox baptism. Rather, it's a Catholic baptism that has in the past been taken by those who left the church in the centuries ago. Although they may use this sacrament oftentimes in goodwill, our separated brethren use ultimately what are stolen goods, illegally, and yes, sacrilegiously. But their use demonstrates that the Catholic Church can have saving effects. For example, when a baby, a baby is baptized using water and the correct words, even in a Lutheran assembly, The infant is given sacramental character, the habit of faith, as well as sanctifying grace, and actually becomes, whether they realize it or not, connected to the Roman Catholic Church, at least until he reaches that age of reason, where he may or may not embrace the heresy of his religious group. 
Now, in an interview with a secular newspaper in the year 2000, a Roman Catholic prelate was asked about a special word used at the most recent council in a document on Holy Church, namely the term subsists. The prelate stated that the church changed Pope Pius XII's verb is, as in the mystical body of Christ is the Catholic Church, to the verb subsists, as in the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. Now, when asked to comment on this by the reporter, the prelate stated that the word subsist was used because the council wished to affirm that the being of the church is a larger identity than the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. Another cleric, namely Father Avery Dulles, S.J., God rest his soul, he added to some confusion a few years ago. Although... Father Dulles was received into the church by Father Leonard Feeney. <laughs> he was the godfather, as well as the priest who baptized him. Cardinal Dulles, God rest his soul, has embraced a different view of things now. The Church of Christ, say to Father Dulles, is not exclusively identical to the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of Christ does indeed subsist in Roman Catholicism, but it's also present in varying degrees in all other Christian groups. And finally, such statements made by very influential people led the infamous, I choose that word carefully, the infamous Dominican theologian, Father Edward Skillebex, to conclude the following. It is difficult to say that the Catholic Church is still one anymore, if it's still Catholic and apostolic, when one can say the same thing about all other Christian groups. One might ask then, is the Church of Christ present and active in the Church of Satan when a black mass is offered? These statements made by churchmen are not that much different than the observation made by Muhammad Ali regarding religion being like water. Confusing, ambiguous, or just plain erroneous, the devil is using these statements to lead people up false summits. The devil is using these statements leading people up dangerous peaks, claiming that there's a whole mountain range. There's many, there's a whole mountain range that can bring you to heaven. Not just one mountain, a whole range. This, of course, distracts poor people from climbing the one and only mountain which God has established in Christ and his body. Only one mountain reaches to heaven, and that mountain is the Catholic Church. And this one mountain is completely identical to and the exact same thing as the Catholic Church. And before I move on, I would like to quickly defend the proper understanding of that term, which is so often confused, called subsists, which was used at the recent council. First, if you look up that word in a dictionary, you will find that an alternative word is the verb is. <laughs> subsists and is they're the same thing. But also, if you look up in a, in a fancy philosophical dictionary, you'll find the word subsists means the following. A little Latin here. Essay and say et non in alio. I'll translate that for you. Being which exists in itself and not in any other. But secondly, and here's the key, the person who got the word subsist to us in the first place. It was first used by a man named Father Sebastian Tromp. He first used this word, and he was an excellent theologian. He helped write Pius XII's mystical body of Christ encyclical. And what did the term subsist mean for Father Sebastian Tromp, the one who introduced the word? It meant that the Church of Christ is exclusively one and the same thing as the Catholic Church. And that the Church of Christ exists exclusively in and nowhere else but in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church then is the unique Church of Christ. The Catholic Church is the unique Church of Christ and all other Christian individuals simply belong to religious assemblies. They are members of a sect, not of the church. Now, a few years ago, 
I knelt before a tabernacle in a Catholic church in southern Kentucky. And there also next to me were two members of the laity. And we were kneeling. And with candles lit in our hands. And we had a copy of Pope St. Pius X's Oath Against Modernism. And we began to recite that oath in unison in the church before the tabernacle. And we came to those words, important words for all of us, where we, again, making an oath, said, quote, I sincerely hold that the doctrine of the faith handed down to us from the apostles through the church fathers, I hold that faith in exactly the same meaning and always in the same substance. Same meaning that the apostles had a doctrine of the faith. I believe that too. Therefore, the oath continues, I entirely reject the heretical misrepresentation that dogmas evolve, <laughs> change into some other meaning different from what they used to mean before. And as I preach here this evening, I'm giving you the same message that the church has always given. The mystical body of Christ is the Catholic Church, period. The church of Christ is identical to the Catholic Church. And yes, properly understood, the church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church and not in any other. And the church fathers would agree. Holy Saint Cyprian, the martyr, once stated, there is one God and Christ is one and there is one church founded upon the rock of Peter. And St. Augustine, greatest of all church fathers. St. Augustine writes, No man can find salvation except in the Catholic Church. Outside the Catholic Church, one can have everything else but salvation. You can have honor. You can have all the sacraments. You can sing and answer amen. You can have faith in the Holy Trinity. You can preach it too. But never can one find salvation except in in the Catholic Church, unquote, St. Augustine. All this confusion in ecclesiology, it's going to lead to practical consequences. It's going to lead to some dangerous conclusions. You see, the idea of non-Catholics actually converting is frowned upon now by many. Another prelate of the church stated that the idea of Protestants and Orthodox Christians having to convert to the Catholic Church is an outdated ecclesiology. That's what we used to think in the past. For this prelate and many modern-day Catholics, the various Christian groups, including the Catholic Church, should somehow converge. You see, conversion is no longer the point. It's now convergence. And, of course, others wish to expand this convergence of all religions into one to form a sort of united nations of churches, a world council of churches. And this future church is sort of a loose confederation of various Christian groups and perhaps even non-Christian groups in a new order where everyone is included no matter your faith. Thus we have the spirit of Assisi come upon us with its confusion and diabolical disorientation. We also have in Louisville, the so-called Festival of Faiths. It happens every year in Louisville. The Festival of Faiths, plural, complete with inter-religious dialogue where the idea of conversion is far from the mind of all Catholic participants. And by the way, the headquarters for this great Festival of Faiths in Louisville happens to be on... Muhammad Ali Boulevard. But tradition tells us there's one Lord, one faith, one church. Coming to conclusion here, I recently heard a talk given by a Catholic priest, a cleric, who stated that the Catholic Church was the true church founded by Christ and that it was the best means, the best way of getting into heaven. And the crowd listening to the talk was impressed by the apparent orthodoxy of this priest as he supposedly defended the notion of salvation being found in Christ and the church. The priest then went on to say that the Catholic church was the easiest way of arriving at eternal life. 
It was kind of like a Cadillac limousine smoothly bringing you through the pearly gates above. But for the non-Catholic, however, he was left with lesser means of transportation, perhaps traveling in a spiritual Yugo or Pinto or a rickety old moped. At first hearing, it sounds like a pretty good analogy, but it's actually erroneous. The devil will allow plenty of truth, even 99% of the truth, if he can get people just to deny 1% of the truth. The Roman Catholic Church is not just the best way. It's not just the easiest way. It's the only way of coming to heaven. She is the mystical body of Christ who is inseparable from the Savior of men. That is why we have a dogma. It's not an opinion. It's a repeated dogma over and over again. Extra ecclesium nulla saldus. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Now, to correct the priest's analogy, there is only one vehicle. There is only one train, only one boat that can transport men to heaven, and that's the bark of Peter. As blessed Pius IX infallibly taught, quote, it is to be held by faith that outside the apostolic Roman church, no one can be saved. And that this church is the unique ark of salvation. And that he who does not enter her will perish in the flood, unquote. And Pope Pius IX, blessed Pius IX, also stated, it is a sin to believe that there is salvation outside the Catholic Church. If we believe, which we do, that the Son of God, the invisible head of the church, Jesus Christ, is the one Savior of men, then we must hold, by logical consequence, that the church, which is his body, is the one channel of his salvation. Head and body are one. Christ and his Catholic Church are inseparable. The one hope of salvation comes through him and his united kingdom. Now be careful. Careful tonight when you leave this church, after going to confession, of course. You need to interpret what I have said correctly. I'm not here tonight con to condemn anyone to hell. I'm just informing by using what the fathers have taught. As a Roman Catholic priest, I'm bound to bring the good news of the gospel to provide the sacraments for the people. I am bound to accept the order of things which God has established where Christ is king and his kingdom is the Catholic Church. Christ Jesus is the judge. He knows the hearts of all men. God is not completely bound by or limited by the sacraments providing grace. We leave those who have died to the mercy of God. You know, even Father Leonard Feeney, who I've mentioned tonight before, the famous Jesuit author, he held an extremist version of extra ecclesia nulla salus. He prayed for non-Catholics' souls during the memento for the dead at Mass. He prayed for souls who had died who were not Catholic. But let us also remember the two warnings of two holy popes. Blessed Pius IX condemned the statement I'm about to read. This statement is condemned. We should at least have good hopes for the salvation of those who are in no way in the true church of Christ. Condemned statement. And secondly, Pope Pius XII warned against those who reduce to a meaningless formula the necessity of belonging to the true church in order to gain salvation. In other words, enough. I know that I'm tired of it. I'm tired of answering these questions over and over. Enough of these endless debates about extraordinary means of salvation based on subjectivism. Rather, focus in on the objective truth that men are to be saved and brought to eternal life through membership in the mystical body of Christ, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Let's face it, the missionary efforts of Holy Church have been abysmal over the last half century. I just read a story in one of the magazines about an Amazon missionary, 
a Roman Catholic priest who's been in the Amazon in South America for the past 44 years. And he proudly boasts in this interview that he has never baptized a single individual. He has never brought any person into the church during his 44 years of missionary activity. Well, I'm sure he says, well, I'm sure in some mysterious way they can be saved. You think St. Francis of Xavier thought like that? Do you think St. Peter Chanel, great missionaries, actually thought that way? They wouldn't have traveled halfway around the world if they did. No, they knew that they were responsible to try to get this soul to heaven. Isaac, Job, and all the great North American martyrs, they would give their lives just to baptize a baby who was dying. They didn't think, well, I'm sure there's many different... No, that's in God's hands. We are bound to do what we can. Not too long ago, I was speaking to a bishop about the state of the modern church. And in an unguarded moment, the bishop opened up and he stated that the situation is so bad that we have to begin by reminding Catholics that they're actually Catholic. That is, before we start speaking about various doctrines and teachings and giving people their prayers to memorize, we have to first begin with their Catholic identity. I want to end this conference this evening with a story of Catholic nuns who in no way doubted who they were. They didn't doubt their identity as Catholics. And they died for that faith because it's the only faith. And they died for that faith during the French Revolution. The French Revolution of the 18th century was not only concerned with perverting and twisting those notions of equality and liberty and fraternity, It was also about spilling blood and lots of it and also destroying the Roman Catholic Church. The French Revolution was a time when Satan truly reigned over the people of France, unjustly so. One of the aims of the revolution was to de-Christianize the country, to take Christ and the church out of France. And so instead of worshiping the holy wood of the cross, people would now honor the liberty tree. Instead of worshiping the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and honoring His holy name, they now began to worship the goddess of reason. Instead of seven days in a week, with Sunday consecrated as the Lord's Day, a time to worship and to rest, the revolution would change it to a decade of days. Nine days of work, with the tenth day to honor the cult of man, reason, and the revolution. No child born was allowed to have the name of a Christian saint. And all churches were to be closed and no mass was celebrated. And if anyone resisted this new order, this new way of thinking, this change, they would have to face the wrath of the revolution. Mass shootings, mass drownings, these were the first methods of execution used against those who resisted. But then the revolutionaries found the best way to kill the use of the guillotine. The guillotine was large, had a sharpened and quick blade. It was clean and allowed a crowd, a bloodthirsty crowd, great excitement as that blade came hurling down upon the neck of the next victim. So many thousands, and I mean thousands and thousands of victims, were killed by the leaders of the revolution. And the blood soon from the executed drenched the public square itself. Eventually the horses that were used to bring in carts with the next victims, those horses eventually refused to enter the square. They smelled the stench of death. And in their own way they rebelled and would refuse to go in. And soon a new place of execution was found. The worst and bloodiest time during the French Revolution was known as the Reign of Terror a year-long period between the summer of 1793 and the summer of 1794. Executions were happening daily, with a new victim nearly every single minute during the day. It was during these difficult days for the church in France that a group of nuns decided to offer themselves as a holocaust 
to appease the wrath of God and to restore peace, the peace of Christ to their country. God accepted their offering. Great crowds would come out every day for they saw this execution as a form of entertainment. It seemed as if there would never be enough blood. But on July 17, 1794, that loud crowd, the crowd that had mocked and yelled at victim after victim, was put to complete and absolute silence. Because into the square that day came a group of 16 religious women, 16 nuns being carried in a cart towards the guillotine. They were dressed in their habits in the religious clothing of Carmelite nuns. The nuns were not filled with fear, but rather they were singing in anticipation of their martyrdom. They're dying for the only true faith. They had been arrested, charged, and condemned simply because of their Catholic identity. The fact that they prayed together, lived in community. The crowd was dumbfounded because it heard the nuns chanting hymns, the songs that Many remember from their youth the Salve Regina, the Vene Creator Spiritus, issuing forth from their mouths. And when the cart arrived at the guillotine, the 16 nuns lined up one by one. The nuns first individually renewed their vows of religion, vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And next, each nun turned to their mother superior, and they asked permission to die. Permission to die, mother. The mother superior then stated, Go, my daughter. Permission is granted. Then each nun individually climbed those stairs and voluntarily placed her neck under the blade. And as that blade fell, there would be one less voice singing, but the other nuns kept the song alive with joy until the last martyr breathed her last And the singing on earth, at least, came to an end. The crowds that day went away quietly to their homes, many with tears in their eyes. The reign of terror would end within a few weeks. The wrath of God had been appeased. As those nuns climbed the steps to the guillotine to face execution, they were ascending up the mountain of God, with their crucified Savior. Let us be willing to follow them for the love of Christ and for the love of his one holy, Catholic, apostolic, and Roman church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.